Oh, sorry, that, that's not my preach. I was just checking the microphone was connected. I don't know why I always say 111 into a microphone. It's, I do know the following numbers. It's <laughs> Welcome, everybody. There's still a number of people out of the car park enjoying the sunshine. So, um, those in the car park, if you'd like to come in. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. It's great to be here this morning. We have our young people leading worship this morning. Give them a round of applause. It is so fantastic to see our young people here. Uh, not, not just uh, leading worship because we want to give them a go or because we want to make them feel good, but because they have a, a desire to lead people in worship. And that is uh, fantastic to know that, uh, that we've got young people here in this church who have a passion for leading people in worship, but they're not, these young people are not the church of tomorrow, they're the church of now, they're the church of today, they're very much just as much a part of this church family as any one of us, and um, so we, we want to just thank our young people this morning, I think, Naomi, I think is it your first time on the platform today, it is, I'm sure you're going to be absolutely fantastic, you're going to be awesome, give us a note. No? Okay. Rachel, your first, not your first time on the platform, but I think your first time on the guitar on the platform, isn't it? Fantastic. And uh, Peter, he's on hat at this now. He's done this a few times. Isaac, well, he's part of furniture. And uh, Bradley, it's not your first time on the guitar, is it? Um, but it's been a while, probably since before lockdown, am I right? Yeah. And uh, Clive, I don't think Clive's part of the youth group. <laughs> But he could be, I'm sure, if uh, I'm sure they would accept him. But we're thankful for Clive on the uh, on the bass guitar this morning. Let's stand together. We're going to come and we're going to worship the Lord. But before we do that, I want to tell you a story about Johnny and the Duck. Does anybody know the story of Johnny and the Duck? Anybody heard this story? There was a little boy and he was staying with his grandparents on their farm. And he was given a slingshot as a gift. And he went, this was in the days when you were allowed to give children weapons as gifts. <laughs> and he, he went out into the woods with his slingshot and he was practicing all day long. He had targets on trees and he was practicing all day and he couldn't hit anything. And then as he was on his way back to the farmhouse, he saw his grandma's pet duck. And just on impulse, he swung the slingshot and he threw a stone and it hit the duck square in the head and the duck died. Oh. Oh. He was shocked and he was grieved and he was panicked and so he hid the duck under a pile of leaves and hopes that nobody would find it. And on his way back to the house he noticed that his sister had been watching, she'd seen the whole thing. And later that afternoon when they were having dinner, it was his sister's turn to wash up and just as grandma was clearing things away, she said, oh Johnny, said that he wants to wash up today. And Grandma looked at Johnny and his sister history and remembered the duck. <laughs> and so Johnny got up and he did the washing up. And later that day, it was time for his sister to do the vacuuming. And she said to, uh, to Johnny, remember the duck. And so Johnny ended up doing the vacuuming as well. This went on for days and days with Johnny doing all of his sister's chores and all of the things that she had to do. And every time she was whispering, remember the duck. And after a while, it got so bad that Johnny just couldn't stand it anymore. And he went to his grandma and he confessed that he'd killed the duck. And she said to him, sweetheart, you know what? I knew right from the word go that you'd done it. I was standing in the window and watching and I saw the whole thing. But because I love you, I forgave you. I was just wondering how long it would take for you to come and tell me and choose not to let your sister make a slave of you anymore. The truth is, whatever's in our past, whatever you've done, whatever the devil keeps throwing in your face, lying, cheating, debt, fear, bad habits, hatred, anger, bitterness, whatever it is, whatever it was, you need to know that God is standing in the window and he's seen everything. He's seen the whole lot. And he's already forgiven you. He's just waiting for you to come and own up to what you've done. And for you to stop letting your sin, your past, 
make a slave of you. I'll share just a simple verse of scripture with you. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Forgive one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Let's worship.
who would like to come and share today? Come on. Johnny in the dark? No? Anybody? <laughs> By the way, John, I didn't pick Johnny in the duck because you're here. It's, it's, that's just the name that was in the story when I read it. <laughs> okay, Lauren, come up. Come up. Come and see us. Yeah, give her a round of applause. So, Lauren, tell us what you're going to be doing in Hereford. Um, so, I have a job in the nursery and there's something else that's in Hereford that I start a week tomorrow. Um, I am moving in with a couple from the church um, and mum met them last week, so two of them are living with them at the moment. Um, <laughs> and yeah, um, I'm going to be helping out with the church a little bit, not too much for them. Um, yeah, that's pretty much. Excellent. Now, I've known Lauren since she was. Two, two. She was shorter with it than me then, and um, I think by the time she was about five, she surpassed me in most things, not just in stature. But um, we're going to miss Laura, and I'm going to invite Pastor Malcolm and I'd like Sam and Amanda to come and pray with us this morning. Would you all stand as a church? Can we stand together? I know we've got a lot of people away this morning. We've got a lot of big thanks today. We've got a lot of people away. We've got a lot of people on holiday. And uh, there are others who are not well and they're watching online this morning. But we want to pray for Laura. And I'm going to ask uh, Malcolm to pray first and then Sam and Amanda. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for the work that you do in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that through Jesus you brought us into relationship with yourself. And Lord, we thank you that that's been a wonderful experience also for Laura over her life. That she's come to know you, to love you. She's been in training to serve you. And now, Lord, this opportunity opens up for her in Hereford. And we just pray, Lord, your rich blessing upon her, both in the day-to-day -day work that she will do and the family that she's staying with, but especially in the work she'll be able to do for you there and develop the gifts and calling that you've placed upon yes. her life. Lord, we thank you for her. We pray, Lord, that she'll go in your blessing. Lord, it will be a big step for her. We pray that she'll just know that you are with her every step of the way. And Lord, just as she goes, we pray the same for Elaine and for the family here, Lord, that they will just know your presence too. That as she goes there, that your presence will be with them all as they seek to serve you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for Lauren. God, my prayer is simply this morning that you will, Lord, that you will walk where she walks, that you will go before her, that you will stand beside her, Lord, that you will be behind her, backing her up every step of the way, Father. Lord, may she light up the world wherever she goes. Lord, may she radiate your kingdom wherever she steps. Lord, may she. Uh, Lord, may she pour forth rivers of living water as she moves in the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, bless this woman as she steps into this new, Lord, just, just into this new part of her life, Lord, into this new era. God, walk with her, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Let's worship the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, my God. 
And this morning we come to number eight in that series of ten. The command that's in Exodus chapter 20 verse 15 says very directly, very strongly, you shall not steal. You shall not steal. It must have been an absolutely incredible experience to be one of the crowd that came out of Egypt with Moses. All the incredible things that God did in bringing them out, the way that he brought the, the plagues on Egypt because they weren't willing to let them go and then finally after that terrible final night for them because they wouldn't listen to God when uh, the firstborn in Egypt died but when the people of Israel put the blood of the, the lamb that they had uh, sacrificed to the Lord and had put that on the doorpost on the lintel and that incredible statement that God said to them when they did that on that incredible night, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no one in the house of Israel was harmed that night. And the impact of that was that the Egyptians let them go, and out they came. And the incredible miracles that followed, including, of course, the most famous miracle of all, the crossing of the Red Sea, and out into the desert of Sinai. The people of Israel had been in Egypt for 430 years. 430 years. And finally, again, they are free. And as they wandered there or moved across the desert of Sinai, they came to the foot of the mountain itself, Mount Sinai. And just weeks after that incredible Passover, when God had passed over them and had brought them finally out of the land of Egypt, God there called Moses up to the mountain and gave him these ten commands, the commandments that became the kind of bedrock of the nation of Israel and their relationship with God. And if you have your Bible and you want to follow with me, I just want to read the, the setting of that just briefly as we open up this morning, but if you're not, just, just listen, I'm reading from Exodus 19, just the first six verses and then over to verse 16. This is what we read. In the third month, in fact it was actually two months to the day, just at the beginning of the third month, after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you will speak to, to, to speak to the Israelites. And over to verse 16, we read this. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountains and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood, stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke, because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. The sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. And then, of course gives those ten commandments. The very foundation stones of God's relationship with his chosen people. The basis of the covenant with him. Already in our series we've looked at quite a number of them. The first four commands are what we might call purely spiritual commands. They're about our, their relationship to God. You must have no other gods except me. You mustn't have any idols. You mustn't misuse the name of God. And you're to keep that special day, the Sabbath, to worship God. That 
That's the first four of the commands. And then the rest of the commandments are more about the life of the community, about their relationship to each other. So we've looked at honour your father and mother. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. And this morning we come to this one. Do not steal. What God says to the people is he gives all these commands is, if you keep these, you will be my treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. That surely was a prize to be cherished. It's in the following chapters that many of the commands are unpacked in more detail. Because when you look at these commands, they are very direct, very uncompromising. They are unlimited. Take that command we're looking at this morning, you shall not steal. But steal what? Gold? Silver? Land? Property? Livestock? But God doesn't put any limit on it. He says you shall not steal. If we wind forward 3,000 and more years to today, then we would add to gold, silver, land, property, livestock, things like don't steal time from your employer. Mm. Don't steal your children's future. Don't steal your environment. It's right to challenge each other and the whole community. And what he's saying here is don't steal from others what should be shared together. For the people of Israel in their day, the detail of this particular command is unpacked a little bit more. Two chapters on, if you have your Bible open, turn to chapter 22. Let me just read a few of the verses here that unpacks what this do not steal meant to them. It says this, Exodus 22. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. If a thief is caught breaking in and is struck so that he dies, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed, but if it happens after sunrise, he is guilty of bloodshed. In other words, if he can see the person, he can't kill him for breaking into his house. A thief must certainly make restitution, but if he has nothing, he must be sold to pay for his theft. If the stolen animal is found alive in his possession, whether an ox or donkey or sheep, he must pay back double. If a man grazes his livestock in a field or vineyard and lets them stray and they graze in another man's field, he must make restitution from the best of his own field or vineyard. If a fire breaks out and spreads into thorn bushes so that it burn, the burns shocks of, uh, stocks of grain and standing grain in the whole field, the one who started the fire must make restitution. And so it goes on with great detail on what would happen if somebody was caught stealing. I don't know about you, but when I read all that detail in Exodus 22, it may, makes me think, well, what does this actually mean? They've only left Egypt literally eight weeks ago. They're in the desert. They can't be owning anything in the desert. Why all this detail? Now we might say, of course, well these are commands for the future when they settle in their land eventually, that that's what they have to follow. Well sure, that is true. But I think this level of detail suggests that the problem of theft was endemic in their life in Egypt when they lived in that fertile land in Egypt, that they were, this is what was happening. And this command is there to say how it should be dealt with. Of course, most of it is about livestock. But there's also a reference to money. There's a reference to houses and property. It's a very sad picture, isn't it, of sinful humanity. That you have to have that kind of detail of um, prescriptions of what will happen if somebody is found guilty of stealing, guilty of theft. What the command does, of course, is it touches the heart of the relationship between people. And one of the things it does do 
is it establishes the right to own property. Think of it, you can only steal somebody if it already belongs to somebody, steal somebody if it already belongs to somebody else. So if you like, ownership is a given in the commandment itself. It's all about the protection of the right for human beings to own things. So the question then comes down 3,000 years to you and me. What does it mean to us? Well, I think we can rightly say it gives us the right to own a home. It gives us the right to have a job, the right to have food, the right to have clothing, the right to a future, the right to have a healthy environment in which to live. Today, of course, we can protect our rights very easily with insurance, we have a benefit system, we have safety nets that are there in society to protect those that are the most at risk, those that are the most vulnerable. But the command still stands, do not steal. If you think of it, there is a problem with the right of ownership. Because over time, ownership leads to inequality. And that can happen for a whole host of reasons. It's partly because some people work harder than others and get more. Some people are more successful than others. Perhaps they may have greater skills than someone else and therefore earn more, accumulate more property or wealth. Some simply have better opportunities than others. Some perhaps are better at saving and other people are not very good at saving. But in any settled community, there is going to be inequality of ownership. There are going to be the rich and there are going to be the poor. That's one of the reasons I love one of the things that happened on the day of Pentecost. You know the story how Jesus died on the day of the Passover. We've just been thinking about when they put the blood on the doorposts and the lintels and God said to the people of Israel, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Jesus hung on a cross at Passover. God says to you and to me, if we own Jesus as our Saviour and Lord, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Judgment will not fall on those who acknowledge him. But by the time of Jesus, the Jews had tied the giving of the law, that time on Mount Sinai that we've been looking at with Moses, they tied that to the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, it simply means the day of 50, was the day of the beginning of the barley harvest. And they counted that 50 days inclusively from the time of the Passover. So when the Jews were celebrating the giving of the law to Moses, God poured out his Holy Spirit on that day of Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus hung on the cross. God wrote his law on the hearts of those who acknowledged Jesus as their Saviour and Lord. And on the day of Pentecost, the church was born. The story is in Acts chapter 2. 3,000 people believed as Peter stood up and shared the message of what Jesus had done on the cross. 3,000 became the very foundation of the church. And that's a wonderful story in itself, but there's something even more amazing and transformational. Because as we go into Acts chapter 2, the story of that day, not only did those 3,000 acknowledge Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, that his blood was shed for them, not only did they allow God to write his law in their hearts by his Holy Spirit, so that they became his followers, his people, but this is what it says in Acts chapter 2 verse 45 of those 3,000 people. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. 
selling their possessions and goods they gave to everyone as they had need. Now if you look at the sermon that Peter preached on that day of Pentecost as he told the people who had seen what had happened to the apostles as they spoke with new tongues and as they put their faith in Christ, Peter preached the gospel. He told them why Jesus had died, the fact that because Jesus had died, they could have life through him. But you can search through this sermon at no point did Peter say, once you believe, you have to sell everything you have and give it to, to those that are in need. He never said that. What happened that day was spontaneous. It was transforming. It was done without any instruction to do it. What we, do we read? All the believers were together, had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to everyone as they had need. I guess you know when a person has truly been converted when it hits their pocket. <laughs> you get more detail a little further on in, in Acts chapter 4. It says this, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the, resurrec the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was with them all. There were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to everyone as he had need. It must have been an incredible experience that time after that first day of Pentecost when the church was born. It's an idyllic picture. But I don't think ever this was intended to be a blueprint for communal living. That if you're going to be a Christian, the priority is you have to sell everything and join a kind of communal way of life. It's really about the incredible moment of the day of Pentecost. There is no requirement that Christians had to give up private ownership. And there's no evidence, in fact, in the New Testament that that practice continued after those very first days when the church was born. Once the church was scattered through persecution, and they went all over the Mediterranean world. There's no evidence that they set up communes everywhere and told people they had to sell everything. This was a supernatural moment, a moment of incredible change. But it does speak, doesn't it? about the importance that there are more important things to own than property, than money, than things that you can accumulate. There's a moment a little later on in the life of the early church when the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to one of his trainees. His name was Timothy. And Paul wrote two letters to Timothy. We have them in the New Testament, one first and second Timothy. And they were written very much by Paul as instructions to his trainee minister, Timothy, who was growing in his experience as a leader in the church. And Paul gives him in 1 Timothy a, a lot of instructions about how to lead worship, good instructions to have. He, he gives him instructions about leadership, about caring for people, about pastoral care. But he also gives him instructions about wealth, about possessions. This is what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. If we have food and clothing, we should be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, Timothy, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and Gentleness, godliness with contentment is great. Yeah. 
What Paul is saying to Timothy is, Timothy, ownership is not all it's cracked up to be. We live in a world today where there is incredible inequality. We don't need to know much about the news of our world to know that across our world, millions upon millions are living in abject poverty, struggling to survive, barely getting enough food, and certainly struggling to even find clothes to put on their back. Millions are like that across our world today. And yet, there are others who are incredibly rich, we might even say obscenely rich in some cases. Some of them, of course, when they're rich, become good benefactors. We think of Bill and Melinda Gates and how they give so much of their incredible wealth to good causes, and many other rich people do the same, but not all do that. There's a wonderful moment in the life of Jesus when, as Jesus was teaching and the crowds were all milling around him, one man cried out from the crowd and said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. If you've ever been, as I know Pastor Mark has been, as I have been over the years, in funerals, you'll know that nothing stirs up the crowd more in discussions about the inheritance, who's going to get the money that that person has left. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Luke chapter 12, verse 14, Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. What you own isn't what makes you who you are. What an incredible answer Jesus gave. And then a little later on in the same chapter, Jesus goes on to say this, Luke chapter 12, verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens, they do not sow or reap, they have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Who by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They don't labour or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. How much more will he clothe you, O oh you, of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after such things. And your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom. And these things will be given to you as well. What an incredible teaching by Jesus. Seek his kingdom and he will give you the things that you need. The food, the clothing, the place to live, the place of safety. All the things that you need. He goes on to say, do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. And then this incredible statement by Jesus, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The eighth commandment, you shall not steal. 
What's its name? There are far more important things than possessions, than money, than property, land, wealth. Far more to lay up treasure in heaven, where neither moth or rust can destroy. Thieves can't break in to steal. <coughs> where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. How much better than stealing, laying up treasure in heaven. Let's pray together before the worship team come back and lead us in our worship. Father, we all face the challenges of our lives. And I guess all of us at some point or another have faced the temptation to take what isn't ours. Maybe some of us have given in to that temptation. Maybe today live with the regret of that. Lord, thank you for forgiveness when we acknowledge our sin. But Lord, in this very bleak, very challenging command, you shall not steal. Lord, we thank you. There's so much more hidden here about the value for us, not of building up things in this world, but laying up treasure in heaven, knowing that where our treasure is, that's where our heart will be. Lord, thank you that we can be content with the essentials that you provide. Help us to live our lives holding lightly to the things of this world and not coveting the things that other people have, but knowing that we have the greatest treasure of all. We know that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life in heaven. We have treasure in heaven. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Sing and sing for us. Yeah. Uh -huh. 